You're listening to the Fooled by the Root podcast. Well, I am so glad to have Daryl Nelson back for our second episode. As a reminder, he wrote the book, A Timeline of the Injustice of Adoption Law. I don't know, this book feels so impactful in terms of the history. I learned so much just by reading this. So welcome. Thank you for coming again to talk to us more. So Daryl, yeah, let's start talking about why you wrote this book. Why was this important to you personally to to write this? So um, as you and a lot of your viewers know, adoption is a, a lifetime experience. You know, it happens to us once, hopefully once. Uh, many people, of course, and especially in America, get shared around, I hear. But, um, you know, it's a significant moment in time that, you know, comes to evolve uh, as you evolve as a person. So, and that's what happened to me. You know, I, you know when, I, when I was in my teens, I didn't want to know about it. When I was in my 20s, I kind of got a little bit curious, didn't care too much. In my 30s, I was more in a discovery phase of where I came from. Um, now I'm in my 50s. And um, I have, you know, found out a lot about what happened to me and the laws around what made it possible that that should happen to me. I know much more about how I was affected by it now. So I suppose it's an education as much as anything. And what I did was in my 50s, I obtained a discharge of my adoption. Now, I'm not, I don't think anywhere in the world besides Australia you can actually do this at the moment which means you can actually apply to Supreme Court and get your adoption annulled, if you like. Basically, you become legally who you were born as rather than, you know, names the government or your adoptive parents gave you or over here and I think in America they sort of take one, the original birth certificate away and replace it with a new one. So having found out more information and more lies around what happened to me when I was, you know, born and then adopted, um, I decided that I wanted to, you know, set the record straight. And so I did that. I applied to the Supreme Court, presented a legal case myself and uh, discharged my adoption. Um, but after that happened, there was a hollowness about, you know, I could not, I was still offended at what happened to me, you know, legally as, as much as anything how these things could happen. And, you know, Australia is a pretty young country in terms of the rest of the world. You know, we've been going around for just over 200 years. And I was born in the 60s. And the laws around when I was born made it so very difficult for a mother, a single mother, an unsupported mother, to, you know, have any legal standing whatsoever in, in, in her rights to her own child. So... Um, and these, these laws were so complete, you know, and through the discharge I had read a lot of the law and the different laws as they evolved in the, you know, the, from the 30s to the 60s to the 70s and, and I thought that's not right, you know, and I thought how did it, because, you know, laws are made by men basically, right, and, and they seem so exacting. There was no avenue of a way a woman could actually control what happened to her. You know, they expected basically a woman that's just given birth to take on to the Supreme Court basically to get their child back, and that's not going to happen. Uh, it did, a couple of them tried and they failed. Um, but, you know, generally the laws were so exacting and I thought, how can it be so in a young country? How can it be so perfect? And that led me backwards in time. So then I traced some of the wording in these laws in Australia back to America and then from America back to the UK, to Britain, and, um, you know, hundreds of years prior. So I started writing this as like a healing experience. You know, I was still unsettled by the injustice of it all and I thought, well, I need to, I need to write it down and then it just became bigger and bigger and bigger and then when I finished it I thought, well, I can't just sit on the laptop. I need to share this with people. Um, and so I, so I did. And then I published the book as well. 
um, and, you know, in the hope that adoptive people and maybe even, you know, mothers and, and even fathers that uh, were affected by all this could actually, you know, find out the truth behind all the, all the crap that's out there. I think what's really interesting is when I first opened the book, for some reason I thought it would start in the 1950s, <laughs> but wow. the, the history is so rich. I think it'd be really interesting for you to tell us like the the very last part of this. You know, this is ancient. We're talking about mm. Roman law and Plato mm. and Aristotle. Mm. So that's where this first enters the historical scene. You know, can you just tell us what it was like in that era? Well, I think, uh, you know, <sighs> The book bounces around and is interconnected with adoption and even talks about slavery and uh, and other things as well. And um, I think the back in Roman times, the idea of uh, adoption was was rare, but it was adults adopting adults. You know, it wasn't you know parents stealing children, for want of a better analogy. Um, you know, you had, it was a secession thing. So you had a family that didn't have an heir and they wanted an heir and, uh, you know, had discovered and, and uh, you know, had focused on a particular person and that person would look after them in later life. So it was a dual, um, it's reciprocal type of process where they both had to sign away the rights and say, yes, you're my son and, yes, you're my father, and they both. So it was a, you know, a dual acceptance of responsibility. Um, yes, the lineage continued, um, but, you know, it was a, there was consent. And I think that was back then what they thought adoption was. And if you go back, you know, earlier to, you know, philosophers and things like that, you're talking about, you know, slavery and, and what they thought about that and how they justified the idea of slavery. And I know I'm sort of jumping around topics here, but sometimes, unfortunately, with uh, foster care and institutionalisation, slavery does come up and the slavery of children as well. So these topics are in, intermingled, unfortunately, throughout history. Yes, they certainly are. And I, I know we, we definitely need to go there. I was reading about the Catholic part of this and the Christian part of this. Oh, yeah. Whoa. So can we talk a little bit about that? Oh, okay. That's a rich one, isn't it? I mean, it sure is. I try not to put, I, I try not to just say Catholics because it's not just one Christian order. Um, but the Catholics seem to be heavily involved in some of the wrongs that have been done to children. Obviously, in America, you, you've uncovered through investigative journalism, you found out about, you know, how close the Catholics are to pedophiles, to protecting pedophiles and things like that. Um, my, my book doesn't talk about that, really. It talks about what nuns did and what um, brothers did in, in the name of, well, what was it in the name of, you know? What was it? What was, where was that passage in the Bible that said, you know, a child is worthless? Um, I don't recall that one. And I have read the Bible. So um, I think, I mean, it's coming out more and more. Right now in Ireland, for example, which is a very religious country, uh, there's a place called Tram, T-U-A-M, and only now they've uncovered skeletons of children dumped in what was a, a used septic tank. Uh, and the, the nuns used to feed these children. So basically they were institutions called mother, mother homes or something like that. And the mothers um, used to, you know, become pregnant out of wedlock. The priests from a local town would become aware of this. They would go and counsel the mother to go and give up the child. They would be put into this mother and baby home, that's what it was called. Mother and baby home. The, um, the mother would be forced to work while she's there. Sometimes the work was so horrific um, in these, I think they're called Magdalene laundries. 
Uh, it was physical work. Um, there's a story where a woman just couldn't take it anymore and she chopped off her fingers because she didn't want to pull the, the laundry, the wet laundry out of these big, big machines. She just didn't want to do it anymore and that was her only way out. So there's a lot of forced labour and then the mother had their baby and the baby was taken and confiscated off her and put into a different area of the home. Doesn't sound much like a home, does it? And um, then they could visit their child, I think, once a day for one hour. This is in Ireland I'm talking about. In other countries, you weren't allowed access at all. And then they take, then eventually they, the nuns would try and sell these babies um, to America, uh, to Ireland, of course, and uh, England. And they used to get reward. They used to get paid for selling babies, right? And so the mother might come to see her baby and then it wasn't there anymore. It had been taken. Can you imagine how that would feel? There's, you know, there's a novel and I think um, Dame Judi Dench appeared in a movie about this, uh, particularly about um, the mother and baby homes in Ireland. And uh, she searched all her life to find her son who was searching for, for her as well, but they never connected because the nuns told them lies. And wouldn't connect them. So there's the Catholic Church and its derivatives have a lot of explaining to do. Uh, in the case of Tuam, I think they, you could say they've gotten away with murder because those babies, you know, there was never any investigation of any nun. There was never any uh, brother that went on to trial for the torture uh, and the malnutrition of these babies that died. You know, some of them died from gastroenteritis, you know, because they're, it's just preventable disease. And if you think about, you know, why, you know, these religious orders had a, a certain perspective on an unwanted child or an un, um, a child born out of wedlock, and that was that they were worthless and the mothers were less than worthless. So, you know, if they don't feed the child, then who cares? You know, they used to put, for example, one story I heard was they used to put two babies in one cot and um, they'd put a bottle in and one baby would, would fight over the bottle and they didn't ever monitor uh, the feeding of the baby. So the, the strong baby would win and, and get the bottle and the other baby would, wouldn't get the bottle and wouldn't be fed and, and might die and then be buried in the septic tank. So this is the kind of stuff that was going on in, in Ireland, but it wasn't limited to Ireland. You had this stuff going on in Canada, in America, in Australia, New Zealand. So you can't say that all of this was coincidence. I think it's an orchestrated process that was handed down over time and governments were also implicit in this. So um, the fact that no one's been prosecuted ever for any of this shows how complicit this is. And maybe it'll come out in the future. I hope it does. Um, there's an investigation at the moment into Ireland's, um, you know, institutions. So maybe, maybe, hopefully, it'll come out. At least people are talking about it, which is, which is good. It's a hard topic. It is a hard topic. Just hearing that they were in a septic tank. That I just don't even have any way to respond to that. That would be acknowledge that kind of shock and grief. And it gets harder as we look through history. You know. Mm. Um, I was, there was something in your book and I, sorry, I didn't mark the page, but it was, you were talking about how they used to measure yeah. the size of the skull. And that was the sign of intelligence. And I'm thinking to myself, what is happening? Mm. It, it is absolutely horrible. Can you explain that to us? Because it just plays into this whole, just disassociation that this is a human being. That's right. And, and this is called a science was called craniometry. It's now defunct. It's not a real science, of course. And unfortunately, this is what humans have done over time. They've, they've got excited about something, some new science or some new idea. Um, eugenics is one of those things, which I guess we'll talk about. But craniometry was another one. I mean, Charles Darwin, uh, obviously in his Origin of Species book, um, came up with the idea that um, you know, animals developed over time and uh, the survival of the fittest, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, but other scientists worked off that idea and came up with their own, own ideas. And the craniometry thing was, was to a way to classify um, those human beings that were superior, i.e. white men typically, to those that were inferior, which were included um, native populations and, you know, Africans, black Africans. Um, so they had this idea that they would measure the brain size of, of, of different, um, let's say, humans, because I don't think they called um, native people humans in those days. They recognised them as humans, but they thought they were lesser human. And, and so that was one of the ways of measuring their intelligence was brain size. Later, and it wasn't wasn't much later, it was only, you know, less than 100 years later, you had the idea of eugenics and things like that where um, they were classifying people into those that were, in theory, superior, which, again, were rich white men, and those that were inferior who were, you know, feeble-minded. And that, that word, by the way, was one of the clues that I had in researching this book because that came up throughout history, this idea of feeble-mindedness, um, a person not in charge of their own destiny, if you like. They, talking about eugenics, and I know I'm off topic, but the idea that these theories, these scientific theories could be put into practice before they're properly proven, uh, and in America, you know, they were the leaders of the eugenic notions of the time, uh, and they classified people into different types of people that were, they thought, fit for life or not fit for life. And uh, they started sterilising people that they thought weren't fit for life. Um, and so their offspring never happened. And they sometimes didn't even tell them they were doing it. Yeah, you have, um, unfortunately, that kind of theory where you start classifying people as fit for life or not. Uh, this, you know, superior intellect versus the, the unfit for life directly led into the Holocaust, into Nazi Germany. And, and what Hitler took on were the laws that were um, invented in the United States. Mm. Uh, that's probably not widely known now, but um, some of the, I mean, most of those laws were directly written and uh, endorsed by the Supreme Court of the United States as well. It's just shocking. I'm probably going to say that word multiple times. <laughs> mm. Can you further define eugenics for us? Where did it start, Daryl? And clearly the consequences are catastrophic because that sort of mindset was embraced by one of the most horrific things that's ever happened in history. Yeah. So, Well, it started again with Charles Darwin. So you had uh, his, his book on origin of the of species. and. Um, he had a cousin, and uh, I think it was his first cousin, and, and he came up with the idea that, okay, well, this is, I like this book. It's got good ideas. It explains everything. And, and then he needed to put a link as to, well, how could, you know, we need to differentiate ourselves um, from, you know, other lesser humans, if you like. We're more evolved than, say, a, a native black person, person from Africa. So that was the notion behind that, and that was called social eugenics or social Darwinism, I think, at, at the time. Um, so the, the, there was an idea, really. Darwin had always, had, had always written that, you know, over history, I mean, animals developed over eons, you know, um, the ones that didn't survive didn't breed and the ones that did bred and therefore you had a, a track of of species and development of, of species. But this is over eons, hundreds of thousands of years. But this first cousin decided that he could do what Darwin thought in three generations with humans. So he uh, and others, he got a band of other people around, again, rich white people usually, um, uh, people like uh, even Kellogg that makes cornflakes. Mr Kellogg was involved Rockefeller and others that, that actually financed the scientific work. And there was a guy called Harry Laughlin, and uh, he was, uh, his qualification was he was a high school teacher. Uh, he was also had some veterinarian qualification. 
and he became the leading expert in eugenics and started to draw up the rights of, if you like, right to life um, of certain categories of people. And he started to say, okay, well, you know, deaf people should be classified as lesser, blind people, if you're retarded in some way. Funny thing, uh, Darwin was half deaf himself, so he would have been classified into uh, one of these um, these categories. The categories were expanding. Of course, if you're African-American, then you're already classified as a lesser human being according to these rules. Um, so there was a list of about 12 different, um, you know, categories we could put you in and call you a lesser person. And what they did was uh, one of those categories was feeble-minded, like I said before. And if you were a woman and you were having a baby out of wedlock, you were automatically feeble-minded. So there wasn't any uh, test um, you were categorised and you, because of that classification, you could be put away in an institution for life. This is in America, okay? So this is what was going on. Um, and if you were a woman and you were raped, you could still be put away into an institution. And one of your most famous uh, cases, I think her name was Carrie Buck. When you read this story in the book, it is shocking what happened to her. But uh, she was... Um, born and placed into foster care. When she grew up as a teenager in foster care, she was raped by the cousin of her or her foster family. And the foster family didn't, you know, the, didn't want to know about all that, so they pushed her into institution and said she was feeble-minded. Now, the director of that institution he, there was, at the time, the eugenics notions were pretty new and the laws had been made, but there wasn't too many test cases about the idea of sterilising people. So they wanted to sterilise Carrie Buck so she couldn't breed anymore. Um, and the, like I said, the governor, if you like, of this institution ended up, uh, he was a lawyer as well, and he ended up taking to court through different state law and then eventually to the Supreme Court in the guise of defending Carrie Buck. But what he was really doing was that he was making sure the laws were effective. He didn't actually defend her. He just, um, even the notion that she was feeble-minded would never went to any court. So he ended up getting it through, um, through, through the Supreme Court. Of America and it got endorsed so that sterilisation was endorsed as a way that uh, these unfit people, you know, shouldn't be able to breed. And I think the presiding judge, one of them had, one of his quotes were, um, three generations of imbeciles are enough. And that, that, that law is, by the way, still in place in the States, although you know, a lot of the different uh, areas in the States have uh, disowned the law now, but it was in place for 100 years. And so think about all the, all the kids that um, got sterilised without their consent and um, all the generations that never, you know, never existed because of those laws, based on eugenics, based on a false notion of science. It's just hard. It's hard to grasp. Daryl, now let's just fast forward to for lack of a better word, modern adoption practices. Mm -hmm. What are some of the same themes <laughs> that are so beautifully covered up with nice brochures and advertising? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can, can you start to weave this in for us? Because I don't think we've escaped yet. A um, lot of work mm -hmm. still left to do. But it's sort of hard because the, the, the laws change every few, few years, you know, um, and I'm not an expert on American law, um, but I know in Australia it's, it's much harder now to adopt a child. You know, social workers in the early 1900s, you know, social, the idea of social, what a social worker was didn't exist until then. And then, um, then they started the idea of, of confiscating children from mothers and, uh, and that could be for whatever reason. So... You know, obviously in the um, 1900s, early to mid-1900s, that reason was because you're a single mother. 
Um, and so they, they took children away. It was just a, a routine practice uh, all through Australia, I know, and New Zealand, and I think in America. Um, that was just a default, you know. Even if you had support, even if you were going to get married, doesn't matter. You know, if you had that baby out of wedlock, um, then it was going off to another family. When I talk to non-adoptive people, and, and, you know, get outraged by some of this stuff, they say, oh, you know, the, the, you know that's okay. That was just back then. You know, that, that, that stuff happened then. But unfortunately these laws evolved over hundreds of years and made it okay. You know, where were the people standing up and saying, that's not right, you can't take a child away from a mother? This is humanity we're talking about. This is, this is the, an essence of being a human you know, even primates don't do that. Birds don't do that. You know, birds imprint on a human if you take it as an egg, right? Where did we think that babies are, are, are less than that and exchange and mothers were exchangeable? You know, I don't, I don't understand that. And so when I talk to non-adoptive people, they say, oh, you know, you get over it, you know, You'd be better off, would you think you'd be better off in foster care, an institution? You know, they, they say these things to you, and you think, well, okay, you pick which child you want to give up for your for adoption, then pick which one you had and, and just never see that kid again. And of course, I don't. I think the conversation stops pretty badly then, pretty quickly. But I mean, as far as your question, the law has evolved, and now in Australia at least, it's 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 harder to adopt there's an idea that there's this thing called open adoption, which means that the child as it grows up knows it's adopted and um, it's, you know, the, the, the birth mother can come and visit. Uh, but even that contract is one-sided. And if the adopting parents decide that they don't want to do that anymore after a couple of years, they, they just stop. So the mother still has no rights. The child has no rights. There's no law saying the child has to be told it's adopted. True. So, you know, there's plenty of people out there that don't even know they're adopted, but now this DNA stuff's coming along where you can actually go, oh, yes, I'll find out of my DNA history. And then they find out, hey, I am not related to my parents. So I think it's evolving. I think some people are going to, you know, get some nasty surprises and, uh, you know, how they cope with that is, is, is hard because, you know, like adoptees are overrepresented in, in um, suicides, four to one, four times more likely to commit suicide. Uh, adoptees are overrepresented in jails. Um, wonder why, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's funny because you go back to eugenics and one of the reasons they said that, that where they should remove children from their, from their mothers is to give them a better life, you know, get them away from feeble-minded mothers, give them into a, a, a new family. Uh, it didn't change a thing. All that did was breed more criminals. Um, one of the classifications of eugenics was criminal behaviour, and they classified blue-collar criminals as degenerates and obviously institutionalised and, and their children taken away and... But white-collar criminals, uh, they were classified as part of that, so they're okay. Mm. You can see how there's this rich-poor thing going on, which goes right back to, um, you know, Britain and the poor laws and that as well. Um, I think it's different in every country now. The thing that I find hard about America is that, you know, you can... You can adopt or foster a child. You can foster a child and then decide that you don't want that child anymore. Uh, you can send it back or you can sell the child. When I say sell the child, you can promote the child on a website. Um, there's little fashion shows. The children walk up and down catwalks and say what they like to do in the hope that they can get taken up by another foster family. Um, and, of course, there's a lot of abuse out there, a lot of pe people that are pedophiles that can hang out in these rooms um, and pick which one's going to be next. And there's a lot of abuse amongst, amongst that as well. So we have somehow, we're still classifying children as unworthy of being given their true life. And social workers are still saying, 
well, you know, hey, that woman's on drugs and, and therefore we're going to remove that child. So it's still happening in different ways. It's just evolved into something else. No longer is it as explicit as I'm going to take your child away, you're never going to see it again. It's just turned into something else. And, yes, there's drug problems and, you know, there's abuse um, and these are social problems and so is poverty. It's not a, a DNA issue and this is what they thought back with eugenics. They said, well, it's in your genes. You know, eugenics is good gene. That's the idea of what that word means. And they said, well, you know, if you're poor, obviously you're not fit to breed. We don't want any more poor people here. So, you know, they did think that it was about, you know, your genes or DNA. In those days, I didn't know what DNA was, of course. There's so many things that stand out about what you just said. I My heart was just breaking, imagining the world that we live in right now, as evolved as we are, that these things are occurring still. The children are being, they're a commodity and we're taking the most vulnerable and exploiting them. And it's absolutely horrifying. And, and I also think, you know, adopted parents, even adopted people, even original parent there's so much um vulnerability with all three parties that sure. all of us are you know it, it seems like it's just a playground for someone to come in and just manipulate the parts and pieces in the way that they want to and there's sure. so much co collateral damage so you mm. know just to be devil's advocate here daryl so i've seen a lot of people that have been hurt by their own blood it, it's tricky like what do you see as a solution for children, like if we could just draw the picture of a perfect world, you know, yeah. what would you what would you see as being a better option for those children that all of the means have been exhausted? Now, now, what do we do with this child who has this horrifying dilemma? Well, I think for one thing, you don't change its name. You don't okay. try. Okay. The truth, right? You don't, <laughs> right. I, I, I think the word adoption is bad too. I don't think you even adopt that child. You know, what's wrong with the child having its own history, having its own true identity? Just because, you know, maybe that child needs care and support. Maybe, the, you know, I don't know the origin, original story, but maybe if they're being abused, yeah, they can be cared for. Um but they don't have to lose, like, their identity in the process. They don't have to be lied to. In the book, I think um, there was an experiment done by a scientist one time on primates, and I don't know what the point of the experiment was, but what they did was they took young uh, primates away from their mothers. They um, put a substitute mother in. There were two substitute mothers. The first one was hard. It was made of spikes but it had a, a teat so it could be fed. And the monkey, as it went to feed, it was hurt. It was spiked by this thing that the scientists had made. There was also a substitute mother, a soft, cuddly play mother. And so the scientists basically wanted to see whether the, um, the, the monkey would still go to the spiky mother after it was being hurt. And the, the monkey did, obviously, but it's, it sought solace in the soft mother. And then they did further experiments where they introduced something new into the cage. And the monkey that had the soft mother um, would get shocked at something new in the cage but would retreat to the mother, the soft mother. But the monkey that didn't have that substitute mother would just sit in the corner terrified. Um, the ethics of that experiment, I can't believe it was even done, but I think the point I was trying to say is that even if a child's being hurt, it still needs its mother. It would still go back to the spiky mother because it needs that, it needs to know where it came from, it needs to know its place in the world. Um, sure, there is a substitute, substitute mother that it may get care from and there's nothing wrong with that, perhaps, but the idea that you just take that baby away and and for and shut the door, what is the point of that? 
Is that to protect the adoptive parents? It's certainly not to protect the baby, you know, because, you know, I need my history. I need to know where I came from. I need my identity. Why is that not allowed for me to have when anyone else can have it? You know, just because I'm adopted, why does that mean that I, I don't have the right to my own truth? Um, so they've got to figure out a system where they don't erase that and where you can decide yourself and at different stages of your life, you know, what is the truth? You know, what, who was my father? It wasn't on my birth certificate. They took that away on purpose because they didn't want me knowing. They didn't want it shown. So in New South Wales at the moment, there's this thing called, um, it's a new birth certificate you can get. And uh, it shows you on one column your adoptive parents and on the other column it shows you your birth parents. It's a new thing. Um, and so people are writing away and paying money to get, you know, to find out who they are and things like that. But unfortunately being disappointed because on the, the column that says your true history, it, it doesn't say the father. Uh, or it'll have the wrong information and they'll try and change that information. Like it won't have this, the, the birth sisters and brothers and things like that and they'll try to put it on, but they're denied. So it's just another way of it's evolving over time and they still haven't got it right. This is called an integrated birth certificate in New South Wales, but that's not working either, you know. So I think the bottom line is it's got to be truthful. If someone is, if the child's being abused, Okay, maybe you have to get out of that environment. But the answer is the baby's going to eventually grow into a child who wants their mum, who wants to know what happened to them and why and wants to understand. And I think just closing a door and saying, hey, here's a fresh life, get on with it, that's not the answer. It's been proven not to be the answer. In Australia, there's been apologies. They've apologised over time. I don't think anyone in America has ever apologised for this, have they? I think sometimes you find in, in, I think in Ireland there's been apologies over the Magdalene Lauderies and things like that, but our Prime Minister, Julia Gillard, uh, a few years ago stood up and apologised to all those victims of what they called was forced adoption. That was the mothers, the, the children of the adopted children and the fathers sometimes that didn't even know. So... Um, that, that went down pretty well. That was about nine years ago now. Um, prior to that, the government had apologised over um, the, the institutionalised children and they called them the forgotten Australians. So these were children like, uh, for example, of new Australians, of Italian or migrants that had sent their children to Australia for a better life, hoping they would have a better life, but ended up in these institutions. Uh, where they, again, were run by nuns and, and they were tortured and they were, again, just like Ireland, they were mistreated and um, sexually abused, physically abused. Uh, they were denied basic um, food. Some of those people survived and, and have mental health issues today um, and some didn't survive. And then before that, there was another set of people they called the, the Stolen Generation. You might have heard of them. And that were the Aboriginal Australians. So they were in, in, with the idea of white assimilation of black people. So they took the black children away from their Aboriginal parents and put them in institutions where they were trained um, not to speak Aboriginal language. They were trained to speak English. They were um, trained to be slaves of white people, even though slavery is abolished. They were trained to, uh, you know, do laundry and, and uh, wait on white people and be adopted into those families or fostered by them. So we've had three sets of apologies. We've had stolen generation, forgotten Australians and forced adoption. Um, what's changed? Okay, those practices aren't going on, but they've turned into other, other practices. Uh, and there's been no compensation. I think stolen generations are starting to, to try and sue the government over what happened to them. But they wait so long that the people that have been affected aren't around anymore. They, they died, died. So my apology without any solution, um, you know, we won't do that ever again, I think was one of the Julia Gillard quotes. And then 
just recently in last last year in Queensland, they had brought a new uh, law into Parliament that said that adoption was one of the first choices if if there was some abuse going on in the home. So, you know, as much as it changes, as much as it stays the same. Oh, Daryl, well, your book, it, in my mind, is a must read. It really adds, it just adds that historical girth and understanding. Part of the solution lies in understanding and exposure. You know, I'm sure you've had that, your experience when you were researching this book. You know, you can't unsee or unread, no. you know, you, you can't no. back, you can't back up on that now. And I think that's no. the same for society when they start to see and realize and really deeply understand this issue. And then in my mind, legal action and um, sadly, you know, penalizing people with money, you know, getting paid for the, that's usually how things change, you know, by changing laws. Yeah, and right. It's just not an apology, but I guess that's a start. It's a start. <laughs> well, it's a start to heal. I but suppose. it's not. But it's not. And it's not enough to prevent. Well, something. an apology sort of thing. You know, you think, okay, you've got to forgive somehow, right? As an adoptee or a mother that had their child removed, you've got to forgive. That's a pretty hard thing to forgive. You know, you've you've just taken me, and you've. Take me from here and you put me over here for all my life. And I've got to forgive that. You know, I've done a lot of healing myself about my birth mother and that story. And um, there's been a lot of lies and come through the other end of that. But unfortunately, it's something I haven't been able to do is um, forgive the government and their role in what happened to me. Uh, maybe this book was a way to try and make sense of it. You know, because I, I just couldn't understand it. You know, these things were supposedly done in my best interest. So it's not in my best interest to remove me from my, my parents, especially because before I was adopted, they were married. I had a home I could have gone to. I missed out on my brothers and sister all my life because of my best interests. You know, some social worker decided that, and it was a flick of a wrist in a moment of time, my best interests change over time. And like you were saying before, uh, a child born into a drug family or abusive family, that can change. It can change in five years, ten years. The child has a can go visit. You know, they, they have a right. It's in their best interest to have that. You know, you mentioned before about, you know, I think Americans call it the fog right? Adoption. In the, we don't use that term here, but it's a good analogy where, you know, you, you, you're in the fog and, you, you know, you're in, in the mist and you believe what you're told and, you, you know, you're happy with your life. And plenty of adoptees are happy in the fog and there's nothing wrong with that. But once you get out of the fog and see the truth, you can't go back. Like you said, you know, like when you see what's been done to you, and to you, you know, your mother, right? It's pretty hard. You can't go, oh, I don't like that. I'll go back in the fog, you know. So, I do, you know, do I ever wish that I didn't know the truth? You know, I've never thought that. As hard as it is to digest, you know, I still want to know the truth, even though it hurts, you know, even though that spiky monkey is, is there, it's still, you're still going to go back and, and want that. You know, I still want, as much as I love my adoptive mom and all that and that's all fine, I want the life that I was cheated out of as well. I'm never going to get it. I'm never going to repair what damage has been done. I'm just going to do with it. But I, I can't ever, I can't have everything. And, and even when you discharge your adoption, they, they make you choose. Okay, well, you legally have to be you, you're, you, who you're born to now. You can't legally be adopted as well, even though you're both. So we are people that are uh, dual, if you're lucky, dual set. If you're not lucky, more than that. But getting back to the idea of best interest, that was another little word, this beyond the feeble-minded stuff, that I thought, well, hang on, how can that be my best interest? You know, what is that in law? And, of course, I looked up what best interests were. There's no definition for that in law. It's up to a judge on a certain day at a certain time to decide what that is. 
So I went back in time to see what best interests were, back to America, back to England. And again, the poor laws came out. And the poor laws were about rich people that owned property, had to pay rates, and they had workers uh, on the property, and, and they, they needed to make sure those workers were always working because they were paying rates, they wanted to get the money. And when a woman became pregnant in a family, that was, that was bad because it took her away from working. So then they just devised these laws, which were called the poor laws, and it gave them the right to take children away so that the mother could go back to work. And so the best interests of the child were then defined by the fact that the, the rich landowner, it was better for that person that child be given away. So that's not the best interest of the child, that's the best interest of the landowner. And then that was, I think they were 12 years old when they can do that, and then the poor laws were changed again later on, and they were called the new poor laws. And then it was taking babies, not just taking 12-year-olds. So uh, from birth they could remove the child and have that woman back into the industrial work that they were doing. And, and the kids were trained to do the same work that their parents were doing for the rich people again. So best interest then changed again because it was best interest of the child to get educated into work so that it could have a productive living. So, you know, it's convenient that these laws suit the people making the laws. You know, the removal mm -hmm. of children from Aborigines or Native Americans or, you know, Indian Canadians or whatever, I mean, they were devised by people that wanted to assimilate uh, children into another way of thinking and eradicate that race. So the best interests of the child were never at heart. And, and for those people that are, are come and out of the fog now, um, don't ever think it was in your best interest because it never was. This has been such an incredible two episodes with you. <laughs> yeah. And... I you agreed before we pressed record to to read your poem and I just think that would be a fantastic conclusion to at least this part and then I think we need to come back again because <laughs> there's more to say. Sure. Well I you know this when I when I wrote my book I tried to be arm's length. You know I tried obviously I've got a point of view and you've heard it today. Um, but I tried to just as far as the history is concerned put down how it is black and white. But I also had to put a piece of me in the back of this book uh, as to what I thought. And I did that in two ways. One was a letter to the authors of The Cruelty, I called it, um, and the other one was a, a poem that I wrote. This is called Adoption Masters. I'm a social worker. I decide people's fates. I play God. If an unwed mother, the girl, it's in my sights. She won't escape. I'll make sure her newborn is protected from her. Extract consent. Take it away from the love and the harm. Place it and hide it where only I know. I believe in God. I'm from a religious order that cares. I strapped down the girl and cuffed her hands and legs, bound her breasts. I placed the sheet between her face and the child. I made sure she never saw that baby. I'm here to feel like she was worthless. God says she is. I'm sure that's in the Bible somewhere. I'm the doctor, the expert. I gave her drugs to sedate the rage. I had to judge whether the baby was worthless too. Did it belong in state care, a human zoo? If it was blonde and blue-eyed, it was probably A-OK. -okay. Otherwise, there was nothing I could do. I did my job and I'd do it again, again. I really care. And I do it again and again. I'm a eugenicist. It's a big word, but it means we believe in our superiority. Survival of the fittest, the right for the rich to dominate, fate of the poor and the blacks to die out. And the unwed mothers? Well, they're feeble-minded too, unfit. We did our work. We made our science. We had the power. We pushed our program into law. We stand by its effectiveness. We are the governments of the day. We represent the silent majority, the moral masses, who turned a blind eye to all the pain we make. We make the laws, skew the books to ensure she's not let off the hook. 
make sure the child goes away for good. We all played our parts, but now we're sorry, really very sorry. We didn't know why it all feels so hurt. What are you complaining about? It's only life, your life. Can't you just go away, be quiet? Don't upset the agenda. Daryl, is there a... <laughs> Is there anything else you want all the beautiful people that are going to be listening to this to know? Is there any hope, encouragement, um, anything you'd like to say? Mm. I'm still figuring half of that out myself, you know. I'm still trying to work out, <laughs> and I think it's a journey for life. I mean, I, I've, had, I've had the guts to do what I did, and um, I feel sorry for those people that haven't got that kind of fortitude that, you know, will ha- have been dealt the cards and have their lot in life set out before them and think that that's, that's all they've got. So the only thing I can do is try and give hope and say, well, you can choose how you feel. One of the quotes from Shakespeare's Hamlet was, um, there's nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. So I think I'm still trying to work it out myself. Don't get me wrong, but I think if, and I don't believe in all the humanity type stuff that goes on where you sort of re, reborn and that try and that fixes the past. I don't think that works. But what I do know is that you can control how you react to something. You know, I, I get a lot of strength from watching other people um, forgive, like Lindy Chamberlain, um, that was accused, you know, of killing her own baby, Azaria, when a dingo basically took it um, after, you know, how many years, 30, 40 years of fighting the government, she finally got that ruling made in her favour that a dingo actually did take her baby um, and she was let out of jail because she was imprisoned as a murderer. And somehow she managed to forgive the government for what they did over all those times that she was incarcerated and broke up her family. And um, so I, I get strength from people like that. I don't understand it, how she can do it, but I, I try very hard to um, let go of the negative stuff. I still need to understand it, still need to process the truth. And, of course, in writing that book, I was horrified and I was indignant and I was offended that, People could do this to other people, hiding behind laws or, or bad science or whatever it was, their racial views. And, and, and so it, it sometimes leaves you with a, a, a bad taste in your mouth about humanity, you know, what, what, what humans do to each other. But then I come across people like you and people like, you know, other groups and, and you see that we're all in this together and we can support each other and we know what it's like even though they don't. We know the fundamental effects it's done to us, it's happened, you know, in, in, in us. These, these things, you know, conjure reactions and that can be turned into negative or positive reactions. It's just the way you can cultivate that in your own mind, I think. Um, don't ever think you're in a, you know, there's something's happened to you, therefore you have to do something else. You, there's a moment in time where you can choose not to, you know, feel a certain way or, or it's not just cause and effect. That's, that's my learning so far. Daryl, thank you so much. 